Hello everyone and welcome to my full Kobolds and Catacombs card review. Uh, we're going to be going through each of the classes one by one, talking about all the cards uh, and you know sharing my thoughts on uh, both how powerful they are and the ways in which I think they can be used. So let's not waste any more time. We'll jump right in starting with Druid. First Druid card is Astral Tiger. And uh, this is actually a really interesting card, because when I first saw the Druid Recruit cards, uh, I kind of had some uh, questions about them, uh, because they didn't really seem all that effective. They specifically recruit minions that cost four or less, and that feels kind of mediocre uh, on the surface, because Druid hasn't had all that many four-cost minions that are particularly overstatted, have like big drawbacks or anything like that. Like a Flame Breathe Faceless, for example, be really powerful with the Recruit 4 or less card, but this gives you a way that you can just keep using your Recruit effects, which is really interesting. It gives you uh, this value slash long game plan with the Recruit deck. And we've seen the uh, other Recruit cards, well, I'll get to those, but there's there's the 8 cost Recruit card that allows you to uh, recruit two things from your deck with Death Rattle, uh, and that, like, just be able to recycle Astral Tigers, you know, forever and ever and ever with, like, a Hadrodox or whatnot with that card. It seems extremely potent. So, uh, I think that this card actually is pretty powerful. It's obviously by itself kind of understated, um, but with the, the various uh, recruit mechanisms in Druid, it does give you this very long-term game plan. And, and I think that once there is the set rotation and the Jade cards actually rotate out, uh, this may become sort of an ultimate long-term value plan that Druid has access to when it no longer has just infinite Jades with Jade Idol. So I think this card has a lot of potential. might not be good immediately on release, um, but I think will uh, certainly be revisited later on. Next up, we have Branching Paths. Uh, this is a Choose Twice card, so it's the only Choose Twice card in the set. Uh, kind of like a Choose One effect, except you get both. Um, and this is kind of a slightly inefficient card in every mode. If you choose like any uh, individual effect twice, uh, like you can draw two cards, you can give your minions plus two attack. Note that this, by the way, it says give your minions plus one attack, not plus one attack this turn. So compared to Savage Roar, it's actually, uh, I believe, a permanent buff. So you know, it's not just a worse Savage Roar, it's a Savage Roar effect that actually persists. So uh, if you are, you know, playing a deck with, say, a bunch of small taunt minions, uh, you know, we've seen a bunch of taunt-type druid decks, this can be very powerful in, like, Tar Creepers, for instance. Uh, also, because it can essentially, at any point, uh, just be used as a four-cost draw to, it's obviously never a dead card. So if you're, like, playing a deck that's looking to build up a bunch of small minions, especially small minions uh, or small attack minions with big health, uh, the second effect of this, the give your minions plus one attack, can be extremely potent. Uh, and then the third mode of gain six armor, you know, is very powerful against aggressive decks. Uh, this can potentially be gain 12 armor for four, which is comparable to greater healing potion, uh, and also goes, of course, very well with the cards that care about armor uh, that Druid got in this set. So uh, I think that this is a card that, you know, has just a lot of places that it can potentially live, uh, and would expect to see this card to see a, a pretty significant amount of play as a result. Uh, a lot of Druid's power in the sort of choose one style cards is in flexibility. And this is a card with a lot of flexibility that at worst, you can always cycle it through your deck. Yes, it can be a little bit expensive, but of course Druid has lots of mana acceleration and ramp, uh, which can make this card uh, really, really effective. So uh, I think this is a, quite a strong card. Next up, we have Greedy Sprite. Uh, speaking of mana acceleration, you know, this is another sort of mana acceleration tool available for Druid. Uh, it's a bit worse than the acceleration that exists now. There's, of course, Wild Growth and Jade Blossom, which just immediately give you access to that mana. Uh, but this comes with the 3-1 body attached to it. Not really a minion that is going to uh, trade all that effectively with a lot of things, because it can easily get killed by your opponent. Uh, but if they kill it, they're accelerating you right away. So there's a lot of tension here. Your opponent either lets you sort of trade in with your minion, uh, and get potentially a reasonably profitable trade. You know, three attack for three is a fine amount of attack, but if they do kill it, you immediately get access to that mana crystal in your turn. So you might as well have Jade Blossomed. Uh, so I think that this is a card that if you are looking for more mana acceleration, especially after the rotation when uh, Jade Blossom is going to be gone, uh, this is a card you very well may be looking to add to your deck. 
Uh, you know, I, th I think that we have seen the power of just having so much mana acceleration, and you can really potentially put this in a deck like Big Druid. You know, it's not like you're playing uh, cards that this really messes up. Barnes has really gone out of most of those decks. But if you were to Barnes into this, it's not that bad because you have Death Rattle uh, gain an empty mana crystal on the one one you get from your Barnes. Uh, it is crucially not at a stat line that gets Potion of Madness because that would be kind of a disaster. So uh, I think that this is a card that can easily find a home. Mana Acceleration is super powerful pretty much wherever it is. Uh, and... You know, we'll see uh, at least a reason of play, and certainly more once uh, the other powerful and acceleration rotates out next year. Next up, we have Grizzled Guardian. Uh, I talked a bit about this card when I was talking about uh, I forget that what that first card's name was Arctic Bear or something like that. I don't really remember, <laughs> but with the uh, the four cost Death Rattle uh, Infinite Recursion minion, essentially, uh, this is a kind of an interesting card. Because on the surface, when I first saw this card, I was thinking, eh, well, you know, big druid and, and decks like that uh, have a ton of really powerful things they can do uh, at eight mana. And uh, this, along with Astral Bear, not Arctic Bear, A Bear, you know, whatever, uh, it can give you some, some powerful, like, just long-term grindy value uh, on the board. Uh, and that, in some metagames, can be quite strong. I don't think this card will be good on release. Uh, I think that the the amount of, of power, like I mentioned, that the, the Jade Druid decks and Big Druid decks are capable of bringing to bear at this sort of mana cost is just the kind of thing that totally outshines this, you know, long-term incremental, you know, three fives that you're getting out uh, with this and the Astral Bear. Uh, and even if you are, you know, playing this over and over again with like Hadronoxes and whatnot, that's just not that strong. It doesn't really have the game-swinging power of a lot of the other big plays that you can be making as a druid right now. Um, I do think that maybe down the line, when uh, Jade rotates out, uh, this could be the same style of long-term value deck. Uh, but for now, I would be really surprised to see Grizzled Guardian get a lot of play. Uh, next up, we have Ironwood Golem. Uh, this card was pretty negatively received when it was revealed. A lot of people saying, oh, it's just slightly better than Ascension with a drawback. And it seems like a lot of those people don't really remember Twilight Guardian because Twilight Guardian was incredibly strong. It was one of the, the reasons that dragon decks were extremely powerful. And you know, just a 3-6 taunt for four, obviously with you know a drawback of can only attack when you have three or more armor, but this is a very, very powerful card. Six is a lot of health for minions to get through. Uh, and three is a lot of attack that they have to sacrifice their own health to attack into. Uh, and, and yes, this has a drawback, but Twilight Guardian kind of had the drawback of sometimes it doesn't have taunt, sometimes it doesn't have three power, and really directed how your deck had to be built. And frankly, Senjin isn't that short of, of being a reasonable card anyway. Uh, I've put Senjin in, you know, a number of decks uh, just because, you know, you want to have some sort of reasonable defensive option at four mana. And, and I think that Ironwood Golem uh, has the potential to be quite good. I did mention the potential for like a taunt druid style deck. Um, when I was talking about Branching Path, you know, so a, a deck that's looking to buff high health minions. This is a very strong high health minion that you can buff. And if you're playing uh, like Branching Paths, you could also be buffing your minions, giving yourself armor so your Iron Golem can attack. Uh, and I think that that is potentially pretty strong. So I think people are kind of sleeping on this card. I don't think it's going to be, you know, the outstanding, oh my god, this card changes the metagame type of thing. But I think there's definitely going to be a deck where this card is strong. And I think in that deck, it's going to be one of the cards that makes that deck tick. I think this is a good card. Next up, we have Ixlid Fungal Lord. Uh, this is obviously a really interesting card. You know, as a five cost two four, it's going to be rare that you can just play this and, you know, have it survive until your next turn and just kind of go nuts with it. Uh, we did see kind of exactly that happen in the reveal stream, but that was with you know, the, the sort of pre-built decks that weren't really optimized for killing minions like most decks really are uh, these days. And this is also a deck that can be potentially quite dangerous. Uh, we mentioned when we were talking about this card on Omnistone that there is a huge risk uh, of this card just getting uh, Potion of Madness and your opponent playing a bunch of minions and copying them. You know, your opponent Potion of Madness this, plays Velen and just mind blasts you. Because that's a 10-mana play and that's going to blow you up. Uh, so I think this is a card that will have really powerful highlight real type moments, both for you and your opponent, uh, if, if Potion of Madness has anything to say about it. Um, and, and certainly maybe an element that is a powerful tool in combo decks, like Aviana Kundex in Wild, 
I can certainly imagine, you know, a world where you play this and, you know, use Twig of the World Tree and, you know, play multiple Malagoses and blow your opponent up. That's a thing that can happen. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I still don't really necessarily feel like this is a card that's going to see, like, fair type play. Uh, but it is something that you really do need to keep in mind uh, for any kind of explosive combo decks because it does have the potential to just double up on a lot of your, your most powerful pieces if you can find a way to, to fit them together. Next up, we have Lesser Jasper Spellstone, uh, which is uh, the Druid Spellstone. Uh, and unlike a lot of the other Spellstones, it uh, is actually a pretty reasonably efficient card to begin with. It costs one to deal two damage to a minion, uh, costs three armor to upgrade. And uh, we can see the upgraded forms of DL4 and DL6. Uh, and this card, I think, is, is interesting potentially as a, in a defensive-oriented uh, Druid deck that may have access to a significant number of armor gain. It is a card that, unlike a lot of the other Spellstones, you may consider just keeping your opening hand. A lot of the Spellstones are relatively expensive cards uh, with sometimes relatively difficult conditions to upgrade, whereas this is a, an early game removal tool that can become an ultra efficient removal tool in the mid game, assuming you can meet the conditional multiple times. Um, so, you know, it's potentially a very powerful tool to just keep yourself alive against early aggression, as well as to have like a, a very powerful tempo swing in the mid game. Um, so I, I actually think that if there is you know, a deck, including the, the four cost recruit spell, which I actually haven't gotten to yet, um, as well as branching paths and such, uh, the taunt uh, minion that we just talked about. Uh, I think that this could be a very powerful tool in those decks because uh, it gives you a lot of early game defense, which is something that Druid often needs, as well as potential to have a mid game, just real tempo reversal with one cost for six damage. And I think that's a very, very strong card potentially. Uh, the issue is, is just, you know, is there enough support with the armor gain? Uh, I'm not sure that's true. I, I don't know that there's enough good armor gain type uh, effects in Druid right now to really justify the inclusion of this. Um, but I, I do think that with enough support, this card has the potential to be very powerful. Uh, next up, we have Oaken Summons, which is, uh, of course, powerful support for the Spellstone, uh, as well as for uh, the 3-6 the Taunt as well. Uh, this card is kind of like a Moonglade Portal, right? Moonglade Portal is, you know, six cost, gain uh, six health, and play a six drop. Uh, random six drop, of course, whereas this is four cost gain six armor, recruit a minion that costs four or less. Uh, you know, if, you, if you consider the fact that Moonglade Portal is a card that does see play, uh, you know, this card, if you have a deck built to support it with a reasonable number of four cost minions, is pretty much just a better version uh, of the Moonglade Portal. So, you know, I, I think that this is potentially one of the, the key cards or the glue cards of that deck that I was just talking about with the Spellstone, uh, because this just does a, quite a bit. You know, if your deck has uh, a reasonable number of, of powerful and efficient four drops in it, uh, you probably don't want to play minions that cost less than four, or at least not many of them. And if you do play minions that cost less than four, you probably want them to be things like the sprite that you're happy to have coming off of a recruit effect because it's accelerating you to your later game anyway. Um, obviously, unlike Moonglade Portal, this isn't a card that you can just put in a, a spell-heavy deck. Uh, you often see Moonglade Portal played in like a, a you know a Yog deck or an Auctioneer type deck, um, and and that's not really something, of course, that that this facilitates. Uh, you know, eight Arcane Giant things like that. Yes, this can help get you uh, the discount on your Arcane Giant, but your Arcane Giant deck probably doesn't have great efficient four cost cards to actually really put into that shell. Um, so I, I do like the fact that this is a card that's a powerful Druid card in a very different Druid deck than any of the ones that exist right now. You know, th this is not a good card in Big Druid. This is not a good card in Jade Druid. You know, maybe you play this in a deck that has basically the, the Taunt Guy, Thandral, and like one or two other things. So you're guaranteed to get a big uh, four cost minion that your opponent really wants to kill in the case of Thandral, or uh, it's tough for your opponent to kill in the case of the three six Taunt. Uh, and, you know, I could see there being some powerful uh, things going on there. Maybe you're, you're also playing the Astral Tigers to give yourself the ability to, you know, grind the long game, never have your Oaken Summons uh, end up being uh, inefficient because you, you, you don't get anything off of it. So I, I do think this is potentially, you know, a, quite a strong card uh, if that sort of shell of a deck comes together. Uh, and I, I think that it's definitely between this and the Spellstone, the 3-6, there's a lot of strong tools there as to whether, again, those tools are strong enough uh, to really supplant the power of just ramp druid style deck, jade druid, big druid. 
I doubt it right now, but again, it's important to keep these sorts of things in mind, especially since uh, we will be losing a lot of those cards to rotation come the beginning of next year. So keep this card in mind. Might not be powerful right now, but I think has a lot of potential. And lastly for Druid, uh, we have Twig of the World Tree. Uh, this is a really weird card because it, it's a four cost weapon with five, uh, five durability. And obviously if you just play this on four and just keep swinging with it, you don't really ramp much when you hit the death rattle of it. Um, so using this as a ramp tool uh, is not really how this will see play. Trigger the World Tree, uh, much like the, the Mold Sculptor, Fungus Sculptor, whatever his name is, Ixel? I forget his name already. <laughs> but uh, this feels like a card that's built to be comboed. It's built to, to give you a, a single big turn uh, rather than be any kind of ramp effect. You could potentially, you know, try and play this with like, you know, a Medivh to ramp to 10 early, but most of what you're gonna be doing with playing the Medivh is playing the Medivh and then immediately casting, you know, Ultimate Infestation in order to, to take advantage of the, the mana reset here. Uh, so, you know, this card I think is, is clearly at its best in decks that are looking to, to take the, uh, a single turn and, and make it like overwhelmingly powerful. And that's something that Druid already does pretty well is have overwhelmingly big turns. Um, and, and I'm not sure if it's worth it, the inclusion of a card like this in, say, typical Big Druid uh, to give you access to Medivh into Infestation or you know something similar to that, because A, the deck is already capable of doing that on its own, and B, you know, what are you like replacing with this? You obviously can't really replace Ramp in a Big Druid style deck. Um, you can't really replace necessarily like that many of the big minions because you need to have big things to do later in the game. Um, but, you know, it, it is something that in like a Malagos type deck, I think potentially can have a lot of, of, uh, of power because you are looking to have that big over, you know, overpowered mana turn by playing like, you know, potentially multiple Malagoses uh, along with the, the Fungal Sculptor dude or whatever, or just playing, you know, Malagos reset my mana, cast all these spells. Um, so I think that that, that that is definitely a place where this may find a home. Um, obviously, you know, yes, again, you can do the, the uh, Trigger of the World Tree on like turn eight or whenever you have eight mana, which is never actually turn eight for a druid, right? You can play Medivh, which immediately gives you 10 mana and you can play Ultimate Infestation. And that's sort of the dream is lining all of that up. Um, but I'm not sure that that, that that dream is, you know, nearly as as powerful, nearly as, well, it's more powerful, <laughs> but really necessary to, to just make that deck sort of more powerful uh, in terms of having the individual powerful turns because the deck already does that so well. Um, you know, we may see this being included in like big druid decks for like big druid mirrors or like control deck uh, matchups because that's where I think it's at its best. Uh, but you are sacrificing whatever card you're taking out of your deck as well as like the mana you spend in the middle turns of the game to actually play this when it's doing absolutely nothing. Um, so, you know, there's a big upside in terms of getting that big explosive turn, uh, but obviously a pretty big cost, especially against more aggressive decks uh, where, you know, you, you don't really have the time to spend four mana doing nothing, not accelerating your mana, not interacting with the board, you know, just setting up for a combo turn later on. So uh, obviously a, a very powerful highlight reel type card, and it, I, it definitely will see uh, some play, but I'm, I'm not quite so sure uh, as some people seem to be that it just sort of slots into existing druid decks as they are now. Next up we have Barkskin, uh, which is a one cost spell, give a minion plus three health, gain three armor. Um, this is clearly another card that could potentially uh, work with the Spellstone, with the three six taunt. Uh, it's also, you know, potentially powerful in that, that kind of deck that I was talking about with, you know, high health minions that you're looking to attack buff, you know, maybe the, the taunt style uh, druid deck. Uh, because, you know, being able to preserve your minions plus three health is a lot for one mana uh, and attack onto that three armor, and you know, you're getting a, a very good deal with this uh, in, in terms of being able to preserve your minions, and sp especially strong if you're using other kinds of buffs, maybe branching uh, branching paths and whatnot, uh, or what strong shell scavenger. So I, I think this card has some potential if you know maybe helps uh, sort of fill in those gaps in that particular uh, you know big minionish uh, armor deck that I was talking about a little bit. Uh, I don't think that this is, you know, a card that's going to see, like, a ton of play, but if you compare it to, like, Earthen Scales. Earthen Scales is a card that has found a home in quite a few decks. Um, this feels like it's more of, like, a mid-range-ish Earthen Scales. It gives you more board presence, um, but you're obviously going to have to care quite a bit about uh, the armor that you're getting from it in order for it to find a slot in your deck. All right, next up we have Hunter, 
And uh, the first Hunter card is Cave Hydra. I, I love this card uh, because I think that this is a card that gives Hunter a powerful three mana option that's obviously extremely strong with, say, Houndmaster. Uh, it's a very strong card at allowing you to defend uh, yourself against minion swarms, which is often something that Hunter really struggles with. Uh, right now, you know, Hunter playing as a deck like Zoo uh, or, you know, like Aggro Shaman, Evolve Shaman, is just going to fall behind. And because the vast majority of what the, the class does is just sort of single target type attacks, big damage chunks in various places, it's very difficult to compete with those style of, of board presence type decks. Uh, you obviously have access to Unleash the Hounds, but as we've seen kind of minions get better, there are fewer 2-1 minions being played. You know, there's more high health utility type minions being played. It makes Unleash the Hounds that much worse. So you need, as a hunter, something to look for uh, in order to allow you to actually kind of claw your way back into the board. Um, I have used Dispatch Kodo to do that. You know, obviously a huge element of, of that right now is just the power of Galaka Crawler against how many pirates are out there. But Cave Hydra is just fantastic at that. Um, and it's also a card that, that works extremely well with like hand buffs type stuff. Um, I've tried quite often to try and get the, uh, what's his name, Trog Beast Rager or Shaky, uh, Shaky Zip Gutter. Uh, both of them to really have a home uh, in Hunter decks. And I think this is a card that can enable those to be powerful enough to maybe see play, because th if this gets buffed, you know, if this becomes like a 4-6, that is incredibly swingy, really difficult for your opponents to remove and potentially rip up their board. So uh, I'm really excited about this card and I uh, expect it to see maybe not a lot of play because I think that we may still see like aggressive Hunter decks as the norm for Hunter type strategies but could definitely uh, help cause a resurgence in, in mid-range hunter type decks. Uh, next up we have Crushing Walls. Uh, this is obviously one of the first cards we saw from Kobolds and Catacombs, and uh, I still feel the same way I did then. Uh, this is a really cool flavor card of, you know, look, the walls are closing in, your minions on the outside are dead, um, but I, I don't think this card is, is likely to be any good. Um, maybe it's a card that if you are looking to play the, the no minion deck that you basically have to put into your deck because you don't have enough cards otherwise, but this card is just, just really, really weak. You know, you compare it to Deadly Shot, it costs over twice as much as Deadly Shot, and your opponent can kind of play around it quite similarly. Um, just not a particularly powerful card, too inefficient, um, but may, uh, may end up seeing play just because people have no real other choice. All right, next up is Flanking Strike. Uh, I think this card is very good. It is potentially a problem that you can't play this card uh, in a lot of situations against controlling decks that don't have minions on the board. Uh, but I have, as I mentioned earlier, played a lot of Dispatch Kodo. And Dispatch Kodo is, you know, a powerful hunter tool that allows you to, you know, try and get back into games where you're behind. And this does that, but is generally just better. Dealing three damage is obviously more than two damage. Um, and we've actually seen, you know, the Fireplume Phoenix uh, see a reasonable amount of play, obviously in elemental base decks, uh, but that card is, is okay. And I think it's a little bit off from, from being quite good. Uh, the fact that this can't go face does make it potentially uh, a, prob a problem against minion light decks, but this is obviously a card that can help facilitate the, the no minion strategy or even just the low minion strategy that we sometimes see with Barnes Yasharaj. Um, or Yogg Hunter decks. Uh, so I think that this has a lot of places that it could potentially find a home. Uh, and in those decks, I think this will be one of the best decks. Uh, in those decks, I think this will be one of the best cards uh, simply because you know, it, it gives you board presence, removal all in one at, at a point where Hunter needs help. Lots of Hunter uh, decks that I play end up having, you know, maybe Houndmaster at four or nothing if they're not really playing that many uh, cheap beasts that can survive until then. Uh, and this fits squarely in that spot where, uh, where you needed something to help fill out your curve. Next up, we have uh, one of the cards that I'm actually the most excited about for the entire expansion, which is Cathrena Winterwisp. So when I first saw this, I, I kind of underestimated it because I didn't really think about the implications of the specific card text. Uh, I thought of it kind of like a Barnes Yashiraj type card where you, you play it as pretty much your only minion in your deck along with other sort of big things, but you don't need to do that. The fact that this specifically recruits a beast uh, means that you can have the rest of your deck full of minions that just aren't beasts and then have Kethrena and just big beasts in the rest of your deck. 
Uh, for instance, this is extremely powerful with, say, Cloaked Huntress, uh, a bunch of early game secrets. You, know, you could have Secret Keeper, bunch of secrets, Cloaked Huntress, Bow, Animal Companion. You could have the uh, Arrow, uh, whatever it is, <laughs> Flanking Strike we just talked about, the, the new Spell Stone. You know, this is like a full curve going up that includes no beasts in the early game, and then you get to the late game, maybe you don't even play high main. Maybe the only beasts in your deck are uh, Charging Devil Soars and uh, King Crush. So when you play Kathrana, you always have a big Charging Beast that can immediately attack because the Recruit effect does not trigger the battle cry of Charged Devil Soar, so you always get to attack and can even attack face right away. So this card, I think, is one of the most interesting and most exciting in the entire set. Uh, I think it really gives you a totally different way to think about building a hunter deck because it asks you to do something very differently than every other hunter deck, which is play a lot of cheap beasts. This is like, no, 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 only play gigantic beasts. And uh, if I like anything, it's attacking with gigantic monsters, and, and this lets me do that uh, and does so in, in a really cool and interesting deck building challenge kind of way. So uh, I'm super excited for this card. I don't know if those decks will be good. There's obviously the problem Hunter's always had of, you know, oh, well, what can you actually do to defend yourself to play big things? Uh, but I, I think that with cards like Wandering Monster, uh, you know, the, the, the new Flanking Strike, as well as the Spellstone, you have lots of decent early and mid-game cards that can keep you alive, and hopefully you'll get time to, uh, to play Kathrena and uh, get Gigantic Beasts to crush your opponent. The next card is Lesser Emerald Spellstone. I just talked about this a little bit, but I think this card is one of the more exciting Hunter cards in the set as well. At five mana for summon two 3-3 three, three Wolves, the base version is okay. You know, it's not amazing, uh, but this is, if you have to play it uh, without the upgrade, not the worst play you can possibly make. Gives you reasonable bodies. If your deck cares about beasts, they are beasts, um, and they have reasonable survivability. In a lot of matchups, you'd rather have multiple minions because your opponent can't just attack into one thing or remove one thing and kill it. But the upgraded versions of this are extremely powerful. Uh, the upgrade, you only have to play a single secret to upgrade, which obviously if you're playing a relatively secret heavy deck is not a big cost. Uh, and five cost to summon three 3-3 three, three wolves or four 3-3 three, three wolves is extremely efficient. Uh, this card is obviously quite weak to area effect cards. Uh, if your opponent has Duskbreaker, uh, if your opponent has Dragonfire Potion, or you know, Spell Damage with Holy Nova, obviously they can clear these. The only one of those that I'm really worried about is Duskbreaker, because other than that, uh, all of those are more expensive or uh, otherwise difficult to assemble effects than you're paying straight up for the Spellstone. And the fact that your opponent can have an answer doesn't mean that they always do have an answer. Uh, and I think that this obviously is a powerful card in any like real secret based deck. It's a powerful card in any deck that's looking to play a low number of minions, but still wants to have cards that it can use as uh, efficient threats, like say a no minion deck, uh, or again, you know, Barnes Yashirai style deck. So I think there's a lot of places this can go, um, as you know, just like the uh, the Catherine Winterwisp deck I was just talking about. You know, you don't want to play beasts, but you do want to have threats at this point of the curve. Well, have I got a deal for you? Your deck probably already has secrets because you want to play non-beast things like Cloaked Huntress and whatnot in the early game. Here you go. This is a, a very powerful uh, effect. And uh, if, if Duskbreaker is a very popular card, I think this card will probably not really see much play. Uh, but if that card isn't dominating the metagame, which again, it very well could be, I think this is extremely strong against any like minion-based deck where you're trading in the early game. You know, you, you want to just get a ton of value from this and really help uh, overwhelm your opponents, get you know, powerful trades and such. So this card is, is great, and I think will uh, be one of the better cards in most of the decks that it's in. Next up, we have Rokdalar. Uh, the full name of this is Rokdalar Longbow of the Ancient Keepers. Uh, I should know, I had one of them in World of Warcraft. Uh, I did get rid of it once I got Azrathul, Crossbow of Smiting, which was a way better weapon. <laughs> but regardless, uh, this is clearly uh, a card that goes into the no minion deck, the I hunt alone deck, um, which I, I think does have some potential to be at least a, a reasonable deck. Uh, it, it's clearly you know, making a lot of sacrifices, playing zero minions as a hunter uh, is going to put you in a lot of weird spots. And I don't know that you necessarily have enough tools right now to defend yourself well enough to justify playing zero minions in your deck. But this is a pretty huge payoff. Uh, you know, filling your hand with hunter spells, this can easily be, you know, like a draw nine, a draw ten. Again, 
the assumption is that you can survive to that point, which is the challenge as a hunter. Hunter doesn't necessarily have tremendous survival tools, but I do think that you're getting a lot more of them uh, in this expansion. And there's obviously a lot more cards that can allow you um, to survive uh, and also just actually get board presence like the Spellstone, like Flanking Strike, and, and like, of course, uh, Reddit's favorite card, which we will get to very soon. But I think if that this is a deck, this is one of the best cards in that deck, um, simply because you don't have very much good card draw in Hunter, generally speaking. So anything that can give you a huge burst of cards is quite valuable. It's also you know a, an okay weapon, not an amazing weapon, of course. Four, two for seven is pretty bad. So you're mostly playing this for the battle cry, but it does give you some interaction and isn't just pay seven to just draw a bunch of cards. Uh, so you know I think that this card has uh, you know significant potential if that archetype does end up existing, and it's something that you need to keep an eye on moving forward. I do think one of the, the, the biggest mistakes that players make is evaluating cards only based on the current metagame and not thinking about the long-term potential of them. That's a big part of the reason that I do the kind of card reviews that I do, which is talking about what a deck and metagame would look like where this card can be good, rather than just saying whether or not I think a card is going to see play in a metagame. One of those is, is just predicting, you know, will this card be in a deck? The other is, I think, more productive in terms of trying to, to piece together you know, how a card can be good. And I think that this card may not have the tools to be good right now, but could very well be in the future. Uh, next up, we have Seeping Oozling. Uh, this is a very weird card. Uh, Battle Cry gain the death rattle of a random minion in your deck. Uh, this could very easily go into the Catherine Winter Wisp deck, uh, which, if you don't have any other death rattle minions in your deck, can just obviously get death rattle of recruit a beast, which if you only have gigantic beasts in your deck, this essentially has death rattle recruit king crush or whatever. Uh, that can have some problems with that plan uh, if you do draw your one Catherine or Winter Wisp. But otherwise, you know, this could be extremely, extremely strong. Uh, I actually saw that there was a, uh, a version of this that got posted uh, on the website that was caught uh, five cost. And I actually would not be surprised if this card was, was too good with Catherine or Winter Wisp at five because being able to get, you know, gigantic beasts uh, that early in the game is enormously swingy. Uh, it also, unfortunately, at this point, at six mana, conflicts with uh, high main, so I doubt you're going to see this sort of played honestly. You're only really going to see this played with, you know, Kethrena or, you know, the, the seven cost recruit and eight cost minion, uh, what is it, silver whatever recruiter? I don't know the name of that card. We'll get to that one eventually when it gets to the neutrals. Um, but you know this this does have potential in terms of having huge huge swing turns. It's only it's uh, only available on turn six or later, and obviously your opponent has to kill it, so it's not quite as as overbearing uh, at, at the stage of the game that say like Barnes and Yashiraj or whatever it is. But I do think that this uh, may have some potential to be a, a powerful card in those specific decks. Again, I don't think those decks will be good, but uh, I, you know they, they don't think they have enough consistency to them. But overall, some interesting experiments you can do with this one. Next up we have To My Side, which is the card that has gotten the most ridiculous reaction, second to Purify in the history of Hearthstone. You know, so many people who are just like, oh my god, this card is terrible, this is the worst card I ever printed in Hearthstone, oh my god, it's, it's terrible, Blizzard is stupid. No. You're the one who's bad at looking at cards and thinking about them. <laughs> but no. Uh, I think that this card, you know, again, is the sort of thing that if this has a home, if there is a deck where you can you can actually play no minions, this is an extremely powerful effect. Call of the Wild was the best hunter card for a very long time for eight mana and, you know, doing very similar effect to this. Obviously getting all three, being gu guaranteed all three, uh, is more powerful than getting two of them. Um, it, it does seem, from what we saw of this in the reveal stream, that you always get two different ones. I'm, I'm guessing that's how it probably is programmed. Um, not being guaranteed to get a Huffer is a very big deal because you, you aren't guaranteed to actually have interaction with your opponent's board. And clearly, you're the saddest to get Leoc in a deck that is unlikely to have that many minions. But of course, with the Spellstone, you can very easily have a bunch of minions in play uh, to take advantage of a Leoc from this on turn six. So much like Roque Delar, uh, I think that this is actually potentially a very strong card if that deck has enough tools. Uh, I don't know if that deck will have enough tools. I again sort of doubt that there's quite enough ways to keep yourself alive without minions in the early game, but it's possible um, that 
you know, if you if you do have uh, enough spells and weapons and such to, to to fill out a deck and keep yourself alive, that this is one of the best cards in your deck. And I, I think that that's actually something that that has a, a very real possibility. I don't think this is a bad card by any means. I think that if, if the deck is good, this is one of the better cards in it. Uh, speaking of cards that are uh, good in the solo hunter deck, uh, Candle Shot is super interesting. Uh, you know, cards that can give you a way to, to interact in the early game as Hunter, especially in a way that, that can help keep you alive, uh, like Wandering Monster, it's going to be very, very important to, to preserving your, your life uh, against those decks to help you sort of chip away at the early game board. Uh, it happens to work exceedingly well with Hunter's Mark. And if you're playing a, uh, you know, a solo Hunter deck, Hunter's Mark is one of the many spells you're, you're very likely to fit into your deck. Uh, be able to Hunter's Mark down something, and no matter what it is, punch it in the face, take no damage back, that's quite strong. Uh, and even just by itself, you know, this can help you pick off, you know, a Patches or a, a South Sea Deckhand, whatnot in the early game. Obviously not like super, super powerful, um, but it, I think does have a reasonable amount of potential to fit into certain Hunter decks. All right, and, and last up for Hunter, um, certainly not least, we have Wandering Monster. Uh, remember what I said about Roktalar and To My Side, if, you know, if there is enough support for these? This, I think, is the most important card outside of those two in terms of potentially making the no minion Hunter deck possibly viable. The biggest problem Hunter has in a lot of matchups is just staying alive, uh, especially if you're not going to be able to play with minions in your deck, if you're trying to play the I Hunt Alone deck, you really want to have a way to keep yourself from being just beat up in the early game. And having a secret that immediately protects you in the early turns from your opponent, uh, opponent's minions attacking you is a huge deal. Uh, three cost minions on average are not that great. Um, there's a lot of battle cry three cost minions and, and, and such. I think on average there, are, there may be like a three three. So this isn't great at, at protecting you from big minions, but this is great at protecting you from patches. If your opponent is playing a uh, pirate deck or just a deck that happens to have patches, which is, you know, pretty much every deck, playing this can potentially just eat their patches and give you a minion that can eat the rest of, you know, their other stuff. Crucially, your opponent attacks into it. So whatever it is that you get is damaged. So your opponent can't then backstab the wandering monster that showed up to eat their patches. Uh, I think this card is very good. I think that this is potentially a, a super strong card for both the I Hunt Alone Hunter as well as just general secret based Hunter decks because it is a powerful tool to help defend you in the early turns. Um, there are obviously a lot of super high rolls you can get off of this, like Injured Blademaster, Felguard, the unpronounceable Frost Rider we saw Day 9 get in the reveal stream. Uh, I, I think that this is going to be one of the, the sort of linchpin cards for any of these controlling style of Hunter decks uh, moving forward. And uh, I think people are really sleeping on this one because I haven't heard a lot of talk about this card. Uh, and I think that it has tons of potential to, to really revitalize, uh, well, not revitalize, but vitalize, give any life to a controlling style of Hunter. Uh, next up we have Mage, and the first card for Mage is their legendary weapon, Aluneth. Um, this is clearly a, a very powerful card. Drawing cards is powerful in Hearthstone, and drawing three of them every turn is extremely powerful. This is clearly a card that, that has to go into a proactive style of deck, because there is a real risk playing this card that you just keep drawing cards until you have no more cards. You're just going to get horrifically killed by fatigue, because... Uh, you wear yourself down over and over and over. Uh, I do think this card has tons of potential in like an aggressive burn style of mage deck. You know, whether it is a freeze mage style deck um, or just a straight up burn mage style of deck, uh, being able to assemble 30 points of damage is extremely strong. And, you know, the more cards you draw, the faster you can actually assemble all of that, uh, all of that damage in your hand. So uh, I, I think this is potentially an extremely powerful card. Uh, it, it doesn't even really run the risk of running into weapon removal because you already got paid off. You spent your th six mana, you get you draw three cards, and if your opponent kills it, then all right, fine, it's gone. I already got I already got my cards from it, and now I don't have to worry about spending everything and potentially getting uh, fatigued. The the biggest risk for this feels like it will be you actually run yourself out of cards, uh, and that. You know, if you play enough cheap burn and, and such, it doesn't feel like it's a huge, huge problem. So uh, I would expect this card to see a lot of play and potentially revitalize burn mage style archetypes in the new metagame. Next up, we have Arcane Artificer, uh, which is a 1-2 elemental for one. 
Um, and I've talked to some people about this, and, and they were like, oh, this is like kind of a bad card because you know, it doesn't really influence the game. You play it on one, it can just get itself killed. I don't think it's correct to think about that that way. I think that you think about this card primarily as kind of a kicker card that you, you play alongside your bigger spells later in the game that uh, just gives you sort of bonus armor, and if your opponent doesn't deal with it, can just keep giving you more armor. Uh, I think it's kind of very powerful potentially in controlling mage decks. Maybe not quite good enough to supplant, uh, you know, the like just similar sort of defensive package of like ice barrier, since uh, especially since Archonologist is so good. But I do think that this can potentially see play in sort of the the, the big mage spell decks that maybe don't want to play uh, the secret package. But again, it's you know really a question of whether there's enough incentive to pull you in that direction versus playing, you know, Archonologist Ice Block Barrier, because I think that those are, uh, are such a powerful core that it's difficult to get away from them. Um, but maybe you just play this in, say, you know, a Kazakus Mage style deck that, you know, only can have one of those and wants a little bit more ways to, to keep itself alive to get to, you know, late game of, uh, of Jaina and such. Uh, I don't think the fact that this is an Elemental is particularly likely to matter, because uh, you're you're not really playing elemental synergy stuff typically in, in mage, and I don't still don't think even with the new cards there's really enough to get you there. But I think that this you know has the potential to be quite strong um, as to whether it, it's actually worth supplanting those other spots. Again, I, I think is questionable. Next up we have Deck of Wonders, aka the memeiest of meme cards. Um, I I think that this is pretty clearly a card that will primarily be uh, be played in you know. Highlight real YouTube style uh, meme decks as opposed to any kind of serious competitive deck. Uh, it is potentially good in in your uh, you know big spell style decks, decks that care about playing you know spells that cost five or more or just having expensive spells in their deck. I doubt this will pretty much ever see serious play unless it happens to come off of a, a random effect. But I would love to see it end up in decks because it's clearly going to be a blast. I kind of just wish it was just called Deck of Many Things because it's clearly that from Dungeons and Dragons, but. I guess, you know, you can't steal their IP too much. Uh, next up we have Dragon Collar Alana, which I will clearly be playing in my uh, Deck of Wonders deck because it will be super cool. I'll get all kinds of crazy random things happening, and then I'll also get a bunch of giant dragons. This card I'm, I'm very skeptical about. You know, I think that the Arcane Anomaly thing or whatever it was, Arcane, I forget what it is already, the, the one two that gives you armor, you know, maybe has the potential to be strong in, in, in decks because it can keep you alive, pairing with your, your, your big removal spells. This is something that, like, you know, yes, if you play a bunch of big removal spells, you get to this point in the game, and ta-da, you play potentially, like, a, a big finisher. But I've never felt like I needed a big finisher when I'm playing a, a sort of big spell-type deck in Mage. There's so many good finishers already, uh, which are really highlighted by, by Frostless Jaina that you know, getting to that stage of the game is, is really the challenge in itself, not actually finishing the game once you get there. Maybe you're playing a deck that really wants to have you know, even more late game win conditions, but I feel like this is really gonna, gonna be eclipsed by Mediv and Jaina uh, pretty much the entire time. Yes, this can survive Dragonfire Potion because they're dragons, uh, so it's better against the sort of removal that is, is fairly common, at least right now, uh, but with the introduction of like Psychic Scream and such, I don't know that that's really going to matter nearly as much. And also, you play your 9-mana thing, your opponent end wins all of them away, that feels pretty bad too. So uh, it's hard for me to imagine this being better than the options that already exist to close up the game as a mage, uh, but I certainly want it to be good because, you know, make so many dragons, what's better? Speaking of dragons, Dragon's Fury, uh, which is 5 cost, reveal a spell from your deck, deal damage equal to its cost to all minions. This clearly is a card that, that kind of wants to go in the, the big spell direction of encouraging you to, to sort of question, okay, well, do I include the, the traditional package that we see in most mage decks? Um, and I am very skeptical as to whether this is good enough to get you to take the cheap spells out of your deck. I can't really imagine that this card being in your deck being better than having like Frostbolt, Arcane uh, Intellect, or, you know, Ice Block. Maybe this card is good enough, even if you have you still have like threes and such in your deck. Maybe five mana deal three to everything is a risk you're willing to take uh, in order to play those cards in your deck still. But it just it seems very difficult to justify removing so many of the sort of core cards in Mage um, in order to to make this card work. Maybe you you can have enough like early game minions to defend yourself. Uh, we saw that on a reveal stream. You know it was like a Raven Familiar deck with like Lone Champion and such. 
um, which is definitely like an interesting uh, exercise uh, to see if that's possible. And I do like the fact uh, that you know this is a, a potentially powerful AOE control card that wants you to build your deck very differently than sort of mage decks traditionally have been built. But even if you hit like the the you know threshold where every spell in your deck costs four or more or five or more. You're going to have a lot of boards where this isn't quite good enough uh, in the standard format as it exists now. Your opponent, you know, has a uh, a cobalt scalebane on the board, and you you hit a fireball. It's like, oh well, okay, I'm I'm just going to get run over by that still. Um, you know, it, and and obviously against things that are buffed by Keliseth, if you just hit three, you're you're even going to miss. You know, how long can this go on? And, and that's pretty disastrous too. So. Um, I, I do like the fact that we're seeing experimental designs that go in different directions than the sort of core card pool generally wants you to. But I, I question whether getting rid of that core card pool, especially given how powerful Arcanologist is, is you know justifiable to fit this card into your deck. Uh, maybe you know just play Arcanologist and kind of like play two secrets in your deck and just hope to Arcanologist them out, or you know Arcanologist and not hit the other one. Yeah, you know, there's there's some interesting elements of this kind of like playing, you know, like Reno. You know, people played Reno with like a, a pair of duplicates in their deck and they just hoped to draw it before they Renoed. And, and maybe with this, you know, you still play like a couple of cheap spells, but you, you know, just kind of play the numbers and, and hope to either draw them or not hit them with this effect. Maybe that's worth it. Um, but the effect is certainly very powerful. So uh, we'll see how people build their decks with this or if they do. Uh, it definitely has quite a bit of upside, but uh, potentially a very huge cost. Part of that cost being, of course, you can hit a low-cost spell and just lose. All right, next up we have Explosive Runes. Uh, I like this card a lot better when uh, it was revealed as a fluffy fire rune. I just thought that was hilarious. <laughs> but I think this card is super good. Um, I think that this card has the potential to super power uh, the aggressive secret mage type decks, which have kind of suffered. Uh, I think that, that you don't really have enough secrets that you want to play in a tempo style, like secret mage type deck right now, uh, because you often are kind of pigeonholed into using some of the defensive ones, which just aren't very good in your deck. Whereas this is a, a card that you love to have in that kind of deck. You know, say your opponent plays a, you know, 3-3 three, three or 3-4, three, whatever, you know, the turn after you play this, you both kill it and damage them. And that's exactly what you want. In a tempo mage type deck, you know, you play Mana Worm on one, Arcanologist on two, Kieran Tor Mage this out on three, they try and play a minion, it dies, they take damage, and you just keep attacking their face. That's super strong. And the way that you play against this isn't obvious. And I really like the fact that there are secrets that, is, that are going to cause people to be like, well, I don't know what I should do. Because if you're playing against a deck with Mirror Entity and Explosive Runes, which I think is going to be a relatively common pairing in a tempo secret mage style deck, Against Mirror Entity, you just always want to play your smallest thing because you just don't want to give your opponent a big minion on board. If you play like a Babbling Book or something or a Novice Engineer into an Explosive Runes, you take five. And you, know, you really need to, to parse out whether that's something that you can afford to do at a lot of stages of the game. Uh, and I think that secrets are much more interesting when it's less obvious what you do against them. And this adds a very interesting layer to that. So I think this is both a really cool card design and certainly a very powerful card design and expect this card to see a lot of play and potentially just revitalize that archetype. All right, next up we have Lesser Ruby Spellstone, uh, which two cost to add one random mage spell to your hand. Obviously, the uh, upfront version of this is pretty weak. You need to play two elementals to upgrade, which then gets you the same card as two random mage spells or three random mage spells. At the third level, this is a very powerful card. This is Kabbalist Tome for two mana. Uh, but I really question whether this is a card that is going to really find a home because playing two elementals to upgrade is not a huge cost if you're playing an elemental deck because you're obviously going to quite likely have a lot of elementals to play. I've tried to play a lot of elemental mage though and it's been very difficult. There are some very powerful new elementals in this set that may sort of shift that, um, but I have felt that mage really is at its best when it's using the spells that it has to either control the game or just push tempo in a deck like, you know, Secret Tempo Mage. Um, and the elemental package tries to play like a, a mid-game value type thing. And frankly, that's a lot of what this card does too. This is giving you a little bit of extra resources uh, in a deck that's already gonna have a lot of like incremental ways to get additional resources if you're playing, you know, whether it's Pyros or Servant Calamos or Blaze Caller or whatever else. 
but I, I always felt when I was playing these decks that you know what I was doing wasn't quite powerful enough to keep up with the good minion decks. And this certainly doesn't help that. This certainly doesn't give you any you know tools that are that are uh, gonna let, let you actually you know play well against the other minion based decks. And, and you need to be doing that pretty well in order to like actually be able to compete with most of the metagame because it's usually pretty heavily uh, aggressive slash mid-range type minion decks. Uh, and this card, I think, is, you know, obviously at its upgraded uh, level, a very efficient way to, to get uh, a little bit more value, but that's not really where I ever felt that the, the elemental mage deck suffered because you did have access to so many reasonable value tools. So I, I just don't think this deck, uh, this card, and the with the upgrade elements of this card really fits into what you want to be doing uh, with the, the the elemental mage style deck. Maybe there's like a control slash mid range ish elemental mage, but like I I I've, I haven't been able to find a way to make that work. So unless the new cards in in uh, in this set, and there are some new elementals that that have some potential, which we'll get to soon. Uh, really help revitalize that, uh, I don't really see this card seeing much play. Well, speaking of elementals uh, that may revitalize elemental decks or just end up being totally busted on their own, Leyline Manipulator. Uh, so this is a four cost, four five, so already Yeti in stats, not amazing, but okay. Uh, with Battlecry, if you're holding any cards that didn't start in your deck, reduce their cost by two. Uh, it's important to note that this is any card, not just, mi uh, not just spells, not just minions, any card. So this works very well with cards like the Spellstone we just talked about. Um, it also works very well uh, in combinations that a lot of players have voiced their concern about, uh, including essentially the, the uh, Archmage Antonidas Sorcerer's Apprentice Infinite Fireball combo. Uh, the, the way that this would work is you play two copies of Simulacrum in your deck, uh, you can get your Sorcerer's Apprentices, you Simulacrum them, you lay on Manipulator, and then you can play out the full infinite damage combo from your hand in a single turn, uh, without the need to play anything like the uh, Mage Quest uh, or really anything like that. You just have to draw through your deck, get these cards, you know, play the Simulacrums, play the Manipulator, and just end up with infinite damage. I, I do think that that seems like potentially a, a concern uh, because I am personally not a big fan of uh, from hand easy infinite damage type combos, and that is one of them um, that needs only you know drawing cards from your deck and playing cards, nothing ever have to survive on the board. You don't need to get through a turn with something in play. Um, and the only real way for your opponent to, to, to interrupt it uh, is to kill you or use pretty much exactly Dirty Rat to get one of the combo pieces out of your hand. Uh, so, you know, I, I do think that this card has the potential to, to cause some, some potentially like broken type combos like that one that uh, I know a lot of players are, are not fans of. I know that I am not a fan of. Um, but I, I, I do think that the fact that they are disruptable by Dirty Rat and do require drawing a lot of very specific cards from your deck um, does a lot to, to make it so that they are, are less scary than they otherwise could be. Uh, but even just using this card fairly, I think this card is powerful. Uh, you know, if you are playing, say, an elemental mage type deck, like we were just discussing with the Spellstone, it's obviously very good to give you efficiency off the Spellstone. It can just allow you to uh, get super efficient cards with Primordial Glyph. You know, if you glyph for Pyroblast, then you play Manipulator, you have a six cost Pyroblast. Uh, you, you know, maybe you have a three cost Firelands Portal or something totally outrageous. And if you're playing with uh, Servant of Kalamos or or things like that, you can Servant of Kalamos, get yourself, you know, a big elemental, Layla Manipulator, you can get yourself a Layla Manipulator with your Servant of Kalamos, make your next thing cost even less. And, and lots of, of just really, really powerful things this card can do. So uh, I think this is a, a Powerful card, obviously, in, in that sort of combo deck that we discussed, and maybe a card that can be enough to help revitalize like an actual elemental type mage, or just go into an average mage deck because it just does a lot with the uh, a lot of the mage cards that do exist, like Kabbalah's Tome or Primordial Glyph, just on its own. So uh, this, I think, is one of the better cards of the set, certainly one of the scarier cards in the set, and I think it will see a lot of play. Uh, speaking of random mage spells, there's a, a lot of this going on in this set with, with Deck of Wonders and whatnot. Uh, but Shifting Scroll, this is just each turn is in your hand, transform it into a random mage spell. It seems like there's a, a lot of effort to, to just give mage, you know, lots of random spells and such. But this clearly goes well uh, with Leyline Manipulator. You know, you can play Leyline Manipulator. I imagine it actually is going to carry over. Um, if I recall correctly, when you had uh, cards that discounted any card, it keeps that discount even when it changes it to something else. 
Uh, I, I've had that happen, I think, with, was it Shifter's Eris? I got some discount on my, my minion that it was transformed into, and it carried over to the next one. So, you know, maybe you're playing a, a Lila Manipulator deck with just lots of ways to generate stuff, uh, this being one of them, that can potentially give you, you know, big tempo swings when the right thing comes up. But, uh, you know, it seems like it's tough for this to find its way into a, a high-level competitive deck because it is just, you know, random all the time. You can't really plan for it. Even with, like, a babbling book, you know, obviously get a random spell, but you then get to plan on how you're going to use it sort of going into your future turns. This just kind of has, has to happen to come up uh, as being the card that you need at the moment it turns into that specific spell. And maybe you can make that more efficient with Layla Manipulator, but it's going to be hard to navigate. And last, uh, but certainly not least, the Raven Familiar. Uh, I talked a little bit about this as, you know, maybe this is a card that enables you to have more of a minion-based early game uh, in Mage to facilitate the sort of big spell mage type deck that Dragon's Fury might want. Um, and, and this is, you know, it's a potentially a powerful card. Two cost, if, if this is a two cost card that, that just draws you a spell from your deck, that's a good card. Um, and in most matchups, uh, you, you are likely, if you build your deck around having relatively expensive cards, relatively expensive spells specifically, you are likely to win uh, this against most decks. You usually aren't gonna have a deck that's gonna have higher average spell cost than a deck that is built to have high spell cost. You know, compare this, uh, you're playing this against, say, a uh, Tempo Rogue right now. Tempo Rogue average spell cost is, what, zero? Most Tempo Rogues basically have, have backstab shadow step. So this is essentially just always going to draw you a card as a 2-2 in a lot of matchups. Uh, and that's, that's a very strong card. It's not an amazing Tempo card. Um, there is, of course, the, the, the concern that if you're playing this, uh, you might not be able to really play secrets in your deck if you're trying to guarantee sort of the, the big spell type thing. And maybe that cuts out Archonologist, and Archonologist is probably better than this, because the 2-3 that gets you a very specific thing, you can even play on Curve next turn. Maybe you can play this in deck with both of them. Uh, you know, again, if you are playing Archonologists and Raven Familiars, maybe even if you hit a secret with your Raven Familiar against a lot of decks like, say, Tempo Rogue, you can very easily get, you know, your, your secret out of your deck. This probably asks that you don't play Frostbolt in your deck, uh, because in most matchups that will lose you, that, that sort of exchange. Uh, especially if you're trying to play other stuff like Dragon's Fury, etc. It's hard to, to imagine a, a controlling mage deck that doesn't want to play Frostbolt, but maybe Raven Familiar and Dragon's Fury together are, are enough of a justification to, to try to move away from that. And again, I, I like the fact that there's a lot of cards that make you question playing cards uh, that are otherwise just sort of sacrosanct in uh, a lot of decks these days. You know, maybe you don't play Frostbolt, maybe you don't play Arcane Intellect. Having cards that make you question those inclusions, I think, is really interesting from a deck building perspective and can potentially cause a lot more variant gameplay because decks just look different.